I am your airman. I depend on you. You whose plate is already full. You who's in charge of controlling the controllable. But more often than not, noticing the nuances when things are out of control. Tomorrow, you're going to be surprised. Someone's going to walk into your door, call you on the phone, or send you an urgent text message asking for your help. Or probably what's more likely to happen, someone's going to tell you that someone needs help. You've mastered your position. You've mastered your job. You've reached the top. There is no more competition at the people to the left or to the right of you. That's what Chief Wright told us this morning. And if you've mastered your work and your job, then what's left? The human domain of leadership. If a leader is there to develop more leaders, if a leader's job is to create an environment and a community where people want to thrive and give everything they've got. My question to you, how are you doing that? When you look at the man or woman in the mirror, what do you see? Because that's what they see. When you pause and reflect on how far you've come, do you quickly only go to how far you have yet to go? My question to everyone that I get to work with is, when is the pause for reflection? Where is the pause for learning. Where is the pause to create what Chief Wright called your leadership philosophy? Not just what you do. Maybe not even how you do it. But that ever-present purpose of why. The research shows people don't leave organizations. People don't leave jobs. People don't leave work. People leave people. How are you mastering the human domain? If every single one of us in this room showed up because we were called, there's something beyond having to do something that put us in this room. Just like Ernie, 1943, he, like thousands of others from America, he joined the call. You have to ask why. What created the need for Ernie to uproot himself and find himself at Thorpe Abbott's field in England, serving as a photographer of the 100th Bomb Group, laying on his belly of a frigid airplane with a hole cut in the bottom, photographing the German landscape below, only to return hours, sometimes days later, to take another photograph. What would it be like to go to sleep as Ernie, Havoker, knowing that the nickname for your unit was called the Bloody Hundredth. Because during World War II, the casualty rate of this particular group was so high that when people left, they weren't quite sure who was or wasn't going to come home. What creates in us to raise the hand, to take the oath? to show up and lead, to do our jobs, and to help those around us. Seventy-some-odd years later, my wife is going through the attic of her mom's house, and she finds these old photographs of someone I never knew. And over one weekend, she scans these pictures, loads them up into a website called Flickr.com, and starts typing into Flickr what the tail numbers were, and what the cities were, and who the captains of the airplanes were, who the crews were. That was all written on the back of these photographs. And we had fun. I'm a former high school history teacher. It was good for me to take a look at these photos until Monday morning. Jody's mobile phone rings. Someone tracked her down. Miss Womack, where did you find these photos? Do you have any more of them? And would you donate them to the Palm Springs 100th Bomb Group Museum? Of course, the answer was. So she and her mother drove out, had a wonderful time at this bomb group reunion out in Palm Springs. She finds out that every two years, these same bomb group members, they get together every two years in a larger national. Uh, first of all, why is it every two years, guys? Come on. Do this every year. We need you. 
So Jody comes home from this trip. She says, hey, Jason, yeah? Do you want to go to Cleveland, Ohio to hang out with a bunch of old World War II? Bu- yes. <laughs> yes. And so in September of 2011, I show up to this thing that I probably shouldn't have been a part of. I show up to this thing that I probably should never have known about. And during the presentation, the commander of the now 100th Air Refueling Wing out of Mildenhall, UK, comes over. And he does a presentation to the former pilots who are there in the room, the former bomb group members who are there in the room, and their families. And Bill DeMarco talks about leadership and legacy. He talks about leading people who want to follow, but don't want necessarily to be told what to do. He starts talking about the importance of family and connection and community. And at the end of his presentation, I walk up, I introduce myself, someone who probably shouldn't have been there that day. (laughs) Hey, Colonel DeMarco, I'm Jason Womack, a former high school history teacher. I wrote some books on leadership. I'm the guy that runs around the world talking to organizations. He says, would you come to Mildenhall and talk to my people? The answer is? So next thing I know, we're out at Mildenhall. And I'm getting a whole brief on what it's like to rename streets on the Royal Air Force Base from the states to the names of the planes of the bombers. In fact, our good friend Bob Wolf shot down after only four missions over Germany, taken as a prisoner of war. When Colonel DeMarco presented to Bob Wolf a picture of the nose art that his plane never got that Colonel Bill DeMarco maybe he got permission for this maybe he didn't put up on top of his KC-135 that's when I understood I needed to play a part has anyone's life changed because of something? anybody in this room? something and then your life changed Six months later, I get a phone call from Bill. Hey, Jason, I'm out at ACSC. Would you come out and do a lecture for my airmen? What's the answer? Yes. Six months after that, Jason, we're doing a lecture at ACSC. Would you come out and give your lecture? Four years, I flew out, volunteered, get to talk with my fellow Americans here at ACSC. Eighteen months ago, Bill sends me an email. He says, hey, Jason, yes? Do you know of anybody who might be interested in a more full-time position teaching leadership under this brand new program that General Goldfein just stood up called the Leader Development Course for Squadron Command? To which I said, I know a guy. I know a guy. He's short. And he wears a tie. And when you look at him in the mirror, he smiles. And so I followed you. Just a few years in between. And on January 22nd, I took the oath. And I am serving here at Maxwell Air Force Base, bringing to you the whole human domain of what it means to understand leadership, to build your leadership philosophy, to be a leader of leaders, to be a leader worth following. Chief Wright talked this morning about the arena. And folks, we're in it. I remember the question he asked us this morning. I was sitting right here in the fourth row. And from the stage, I think you remember Chief Wright asked, how many of you are uncomfortable? Do you remember he asked this question? How many of you are uncomfortable? I think I was the only guy that raised his hand. Which one doesn't look like the others? But then he made the case, didn't he? Learning starts at the uncomfort line. Learning begins when you're able to raise your hand in a group of peers and say... (laughs) I don't know. Do you? And have someone look you in your eyes and be vulnerable enough to say no, but we're going to find out together. What does it mean to master the human domain of leadership? I believe there are three areas, and these are the ones that I want to unpack for you as we go through this afternoon. I want to share with you what we have found the best things that a leader can do leaving here. We got you for a week. That's all. Some of you are trying to manage all kinds of things while you're here. Right now, checking an email, checking a text, answering a question. Who's going to check in with a group tonight? Cool. Who's going to check in with a family tonight? And here's my request. 
you understand what makes you tick and the work it takes to understand that gives you a whole new sense of empathy of what it's like to be in their shoes. Gives you a whole new layer of understanding. Anyone ever tried to change anybody else? Pales in comparison to how tough it can be to change oneself. I know of one fast way to do it. Heard earlier talk about the 21 days to make a habit. We were just hearing about that a little bit earlier. So we get 90 days. Basic, I think, is what I heard. Um, here's the deal. You can short change that or you can long change that based on one factor. Who are you spending time with? Quick show of hands. Who knows someone who likes to complain? Awesome. Who knows someone personally? Just kidding. You can see them coming. Huh? Get out of the parking lot, get out of your car, they get out of the car, you start walking toward each other. What do you know is coming? Oh man, can you believe how much traffic there was? It bit the pothole. Can't believe how long cars at the gate. Blah, blah, blah. Versus, quick chance, who's ever had someone recommend you read a book? Who's ever had someone recommend you read a book? Change the conversation. You can change the conversation. That was fascinating. As I listened to Chief Wright this morning. He referenced a book that I'm going to reference today because I had it part of my speech, a book by James Allen called As a Man Thinketh. Don't raise your hands because this will be most of the group. If you don't have this book yet, I brought one. First come, first serve. <laughs> I'm going to read from this book today, but if anyone does not have this one, I've got one to give away this afternoon because where you direct your mind, that's where action follows. See, they're watching you just like you're watching them. Now, there's going to be more than one of us in this room who's sitting in this room because of someone else. There was one person who counseled you, mentored you. They asked you a question. They invited you into their office, and they gave it to you straight. In fact, how many of you had someone's name come to mind when I just went through that little piece? That person, write them a thank you card this weekend. That person, let them know how influential they were. If they've passed, if they're no longer with us, write them a letter. They'll get it. I'm from California, I can say things like this. There's something that happens when we pause and we look at what we remember from who we remember it from. I'm going to give you an activity that's going to get us kick-started into the afternoon. I believe I'm the last brief. Is there anything after me? This is it. So me and beers. Okay. So me and then beers. Let's do this thing. Can I ask you please to grab a blank piece of paper, notebook, something that you can write on and with. If you don't have a piece of paper and a pen, open up your phone to a brand new screen that you can type into. If you don't have either one of those, ask a buddy for a piece of paper. Okay? If you get asked, sell it. I don't know. One for two, two for three. Okay? Now I'm going to time you. I'm going to ask you to take 120 seconds. And in those 120 seconds, I need you to make a long list, okay? So keep some room. You're going to need some room. Long list. I want you to go out one year from today, okay? Title of the speech, be better a year from now than you are today. In fact, we need you to be better tomorrow, but that's a different discussion. A year from now, I'm going to ask you to respond to this prompt as many times as you're willing to be vulnerable with that piece of paper. One year from today, what would you like to be better at as a human being. I'm going to be quiet for 60 seconds, jump in with some more coaching. We'll finish this up in two minutes. Over the next 12 months, what do you know you want to be better at as a human being? Halfway there, let me ask you to double it. If you've got this many, make it that many. And here's my coaching. If someone who cares about you was sitting right next to you, if someone who knows you really well were sitting right next to you and she or he glanced at your piece of paper, what would they nudge you and say, hey, you know what else you can get better at? You know what else I know you're interested in improving? You know what else you're on the planet for? 
me ask you to take 50 more seconds and see if you can double it between now and you a year from new. Uh, now, you look in the mirror 12 months from today, what will you want to have been improving? What will you want to have been getting better at? What will you want to be more comfortable in? As you're writing that last one or as you're typing that last one, let me ask you to put a little period, finish that one up. When you're all ready, if you look up and let me know you're done. Now, this next piece, real careful, I ask you to take that notebook, that piece of paper, that phone, just put it off to the side. Can I ask everyone to carefully stand up? I say carefully because OSHA's watching. I ask you to stand up because you've been sitting down way too much today. Now, I asked you to put those books, notebooks, and phones down for a very specific reason. See, now we're going to go from recency. Recency is always going to give priority. Priority is always going to be the one that we go for. Anyone's life ever changed because you made awkward eye contact somewhere? Has anyone ever had this happen? No, seriously. Your life changed because you looked across the room and saw her or him. Today, you have the chance to make awkward eye contact. Change your life. Not that way. What I'm going to ask you to do is to make awkward eye contact. Find two other people, groups of three. I want you to get together. I want you to share one or two of the top of what made your list. Now, sure, it may be the first one that you wrote down. That's the one that you want to get after. I want you to think. Don't look. I want you to think about that list that you made. Turn to someone. Make awkward eye contact. Introduce yourself. Hey, my name is. And then I want you to share in a trio. What do you want to get better at? Now, has anyone hit the afternoon low energy thing? Is anyone right there? Great. If that's you, don't say anything. Just turn around and say, hey, what would you write down? And then listen for a while. It's totally cool. Track with them. And then how many of you got a short list? Listen as the people tell you because when you grab a seat, then you can add more. We're going to go for a long three minutes. That's about one minute each. If I have a tracker for each team, go, go, go. Three minutes. Introduce yourself to somebody. Share what you want to be better at a year from now. I'll be back in three.
All righty, I'm going to ask you to take about 15 more seconds. Already, we're going to start to wrap that to a close. We're going to do it real easy. So if you can hear me, can I get you to clap your hands one time? If you can hear me, will you clap your hands twice? If you can hear me, will you clap your hands three times? Those of you in the back, I'm going to brief until about 16, 15. If you want to come up a little bit, totally okay with me. Let's get after it. If you come on and grab a seat, let's go into the next three pieces. Now... I shared with you that I was going to reference James Allen's book. And by the way, maybe I should ask now, has anyone not seen the book called As a Man Thinketh by James Allen? Anyone not seen this? Okay. Uh, generally, you can download this as a PDF free somewhere. Just go to the internet and type in As a Man Thinketh PDF. And someone gave it. It's out of uh, copyright, so you can have it. This one put me back uh, a buck um, at a bookstore. Anyway, I'm going to read this one line. Here we go. Only by much searching and mining are gold and diamonds obtained, and man can find every truth connected with his being if he will dig deep into the mine of his soul, the basement. Well, Chief Wright said the basement. I just added that. And that he is the maker of his character, the molder of his life, and the builder of his destiny. What's fascinating to me is there are some people in this room who know more about you currently than some of your spouses. I've been doing this for 20 plus years, gang. I've been asking people to be vulnerable with one another at work. Why? Because at work is where you spend most of your time. I, I, I tried to do the math. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an academic, but I'm a social scientist. So Chief Wright was talking about the two, the 10, the five, the six. He lost me at 10, right? Here's what we know. We spend more time with people who look like us than the people who don't. And so... If I will leave a breadcrumb, nay, if I will lead a stone that lets my fellow group know what I want to be better at. You see, if you'll let me know what you want to be better at. By the way, who, how many of you shared at least one with your colleagues? Shared at least one? Now they have a reason to help. See, if you'll let me know what you want to be better at a year from now, now I know what TED Talk to recommend you watch. Now I know what book to recommend you read. Now I know what conference to suggest that you attend. And the fascinating thing about conferences, the fascinating thing about a week-long training of sitting down watching PowerPoints. You got a lot of PowerPoints around here. I mean, I just joined the Air Force, like not even six weeks ago. A lot of PowerPoints. And apparently I'm not the only one who chases the guy who takes the cell phone when you do that one CBT, but that's another story. Okay, here's what we all know, folks. You come to these conferences, you listen to a lot of the leadership talk about what they know, what they think, and where they're going. You know where the magic is more likely going to happen? Over coffee in the hallway, over beers in the evening. When you're willing to turn to the person beside you, to turn to the person beside you and say, hey, I'm uncomfortable. How about you? Because I have a long list of things that I haven't even shown my spouse I want to improve. That I got a long list of things that I'm a little bit protected about showing my airmen that I want to get better at. Why? I'm supposed to have it all together. I love Chief Wright's example of the cell phone. Did anyone else resonate with that? The cell phone charger? Right? How far away is my phone from a cell phone charger? Very rarely more than 50 yards. So how about you? How do you know yourself to lead yourself? How do you surround yourself by the people who are able to see the circle while you're looking at the triangle? Everyone, you catch that? The point A, the point B thing from, from earlier? Or point A, point B. You remember what it was. Okay. I looked at that as like, oh my gosh, what if I'm sitting in a meeting and the only thing I see is the circle and someone else is describing a triangle? Man, we'll be off. What do you remember from your leaders? I asked you a moment ago, I said, how many of you were in this room because someone kicked you in the seat of the pants, asked you one question, or mentored you? And a lot of hands went up. I'm standing here because I met Bill DeMarco. I met Bill DeMarco because I became a high school teacher. I met, became a high school teacher because Dr. Solberg was looking out of his hallway 
at Santa Barbara City College one day. I don't remember anything of what Dr. Solberg taught me. I remember he asked me one question. In 1991, that changed my life. From a career field I was entering into a career field I made a calling. And if Dr. Solberg hadn't been looking out his office door that one day, I don't know if the rest would have happened. How do you become that leader of leaders? There's a TED speaker out there. Her name is Brene Brown. She's a very, very popular author. She talks a lot about leading from the heart. She talks a lot about real connection. I've got a three-minute video clip from one of her more popular TED Talks. I want to set this up by asking a couple of prompts. Prompt one, who has heard of Brene Brown? Cool. Who has not heard of Brene Brown? I'm just trying to get everyone to raise your hands. You've been sitting down too long. Do some calisthenics. Totally cool. Uh, how many of you have access to a free book borrowing program? Something like your public libraries, the Pentagon libraries, some kind of Libby. Find this. Great. Brene Brown for the past umpteen years, has studied what happens when you turn to someone sitting next to you and tell them what you want to get better at. And in three minutes of this video clip, I think she and I can make the case for what your airmen really want from you. Let me show this. <laughs> so I'm a researcher or storyteller. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today, we're talking about expanding perception, and so I want to talk to you and tell some stories about a piece of my research that fundamentally expanded my perception um, and really actually changed the way that I live and love and work and parent. Um, and this is where my story starts. When I was a young researcher, doctoral student, my first year I had a research professor who said to us, here's the thing, if you cannot measure it, it does not exist. And I thought he was just sweet talking to me. I was like, really? And he's like, absolutely. So you have to understand that I have a bachelor's in social work, a master's in social work, and I was getting my PhD in social work. So my entire academic career was surrounded by people who kind of believed in the life's messy, love it. You know, and I'm more the life's messy, clean it up, <laughs> organize it, and put it into a bento box. Um, <laughs> And so to think that I had found my way, to found a career that takes me, you know, really one of the big sayings in, in social work is lean into the discomfort of the work. And I'm like, you know, knock discomfort upside the head and move it over <laughs> and get all A's. That's my, that was my mantra. So I was very excited about this. And so I thought, you know what, this is the career for me because I am interested in some messy topics, but I want to be able to make them not messy. I want to understand them. I want to hack into these things that I know are important and lay the code out for everyone to see. So where I started was with connection because by the time you're a social worker for 10 years, what you realize is that connection is why we're here. We're connected to something those of us in this room. You've made the choice, as Chief Wright talked about this morning, whether that's for one more year or three more years or a bunch of more years. You're here because you're connected to something. But I would dare say you are connected to someone. I am your airman. And I depend on you. You, whose plate is overflowed with way too much to manage. And if you think you're busy now, wait for six months. And the people around you, they want to feel connected. So I'm going to give you three layers, and I'm going to give you several steps of how you can walk this line of stepping into and further mastering what you already know is true. From the gut, everything I say this afternoon, you're going to say, Jason, that feels right. I love that. That's why I'm a part of this Air Force, and I know what it means if I were to do it. Let's see if we can put some actions behind the knowing. What I want to share with you are some ideas around self-care that transcend selfishness and get us into the land of selflessness. 
I want to talk a little bit about how important it is that you understand that the woman or man in the mirror, the person you look at is who they're looking at. And they've already branded you. They already know you for something. They already know you as something. Ever gotten an email where you and a bunch of your best friends are all invited to a big meeting? And you look down all the list of all the other people who are invited to the meeting and you see someone's name and roll your eyes. What if you're that person that they roll their eyes about? I want to talk about what it takes to build a team to work better, faster, more effectively, more efficiently by looking at cognitive diversity. That is, can I gather people around me who look at a problem from a different angle than I do? See, here at Air University, we're just a bunch of academics. We write research reports. Every now and then, we need to get people who look at things differently than us. Hey, how does this work at 0200 on a rainy day or a snowy day or in that beautiful picture I saw earlier at Minot? How does this work out there? You're five. You're five. Chief Wright talked about this earlier today. Jim Rohn was the guy that taught me about the team of five. I'm going to do a whole piece on that before you get out of here this afternoon. And then finally, we take a look at what it means to be memorable. Not because you're driven from your ego, because you're leaving trails of greatness that other people can step into. Go where I haven't been so it's easier for me to go further. If you can lay track, if you can lay trail... And I don't have to use as much energy to get to your end point. I have more energy to keep on going up that hill or through that valley. I'll end up today with a very specific exercise that I have on gratitude, on reaching back, and on the importance of mentors and mentoring. So let's start with self-care. According to Harvard Business Review, a magazine that looks at this kinds of stuff out in the world, it looks at service organizations, nonprofits, military, and of course businesses. They say that part of our job is to show up ready to do our job. They say that we need to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. They tell us that we already know and get that we have a brand that we are proving or disproving. I often tell my leaders, they're watching you, just like you're watching them. So the question must be on your mind, Jason, how important it is it? How important is it that I take care of myself? How important is it that I show up ready for the next ask, for the next challenge, for the next opportunity? And what I'd like to do is I'd like to transfer over to another group of people who I think is similar to you, another group of people who get asked questions that are answered with a yes or a no all day long. So let me test this. Quick show of hands. How many of you have a job where you get asked yes or no during the day? Okay? So you and this group have some stuff in common. People come to you, they ask you a question, and you're supposed to be able to say yes or no. So here's the data. Here's the research. The research says that if you ask this group of people, okay, if you ask this group of people a yes-no question at this part of the day, you have a 70-plus percent chance of getting a yes. If you go ask this group of people a yes-no question at this time of the day, I think we should just call it zero, okay? And then something happens. They come back. You ask them a yes, no question. Yes, no question. Yes, no question. Yes, no question. Now, ideally, by this time, you're wondering to yourselves, well, what kinds of people were asking what kinds of questions and who was giving the answer? Ready for this? Judges. Eight of them over 10 months, making over 1,100 decisions about whether or not the person in front of them should get parole or not. Now, I don't know about you, but the limited experience I've had with the legal system, which is not a lot, so self-disclosure here, if I know someone who's going to a judge to ask for parole, right, they've been in and they want to get out, wouldn't you think that a judge needs to make a decision based on the law and fairness, maybe time served, gravity of the crime, what kinds of behavior they had while they are in jail? Wouldn't it make sense that the judge is making a decision based on law? That's not the case. That's not the case. And this wasn't just once. This wasn't just a week. 
This was over 1,100 cases where people were coming to the judge wondering, were they going to be able to go home with their family that night or back to jail? And the number one indicator of whether or not they did was when was the last time the judge fed themselves, rested their mind, and moved their body. Now here's the deal. People are coming to you at all hours of the day. Saturday morning, here at Air University, we lost one of our students. A hit and run in Alabama. Commander gets a call Saturday morning. Doesn't matter how rested or nutritioned or moved. He needed to be ready. And my question to each one of you is when are you stopping to look in the mirror and asking yourself, what do they see when they see this? And when you glance around at the mirror, do you see someone who's stressed out, uptight? Do you see someone that doesn't want to be approached? Or do you see someone who is ready for the next yes or no? My question to you, how do you take care of you? That leads me right into your known force. What do you want to be known for? And what are you known for? Every superhero has an origin story. We all got our start somewhere. For us, it was the U.S. Air Force. Your origin story is you're here. Leaving here, you have a question to ask yourself. What do I want to be known for? What do I want the women and men who look at me every single day to know that I bring to the fight? What is it that I do that they have confidence that I'll do my best every single day? So the questions that you get to answer for yourselves. How many of you made a long list of things that you want to get better at? This is the little trick that I play. I take the first one off the list, I cast out into the future, six months to two years. That's about my horizon, that's about how far I can go. I literally joined Air University January 22nd. As a professor at Air University, I want to be known for being prepared for my speeches. As a professor at Air University, I want to be known for a presenter worth listening to. Did you catch the difference between those two last words? That kept me, my wife, and the editors up at night. My wife and I co-wrote a book together on this. We spent hours trying to figure out, do I want to be known for, do I want to be known as? Do I want to be known for, do I want to be known as? And here was the meeting in the middle, both. And if you're taking notes and you want to write this down or taking a picture, here's the distinction. I want to be known for the verbs. I want to be known as the noun. So you look at your list of what you want to get better at over the next year or two and you simply ask yourself, what do I want them to be able to point at me and say he or she is the one that we know as and for? How do we work better together? How do we build a cognitively diverse team? And how do we understand the significance of those five people that we spend the most time with, that those are the ones who are constantly pushing or pulling on our attention? And this isn't something that you think about. This isn't something that you do later when you think you're going to have time. This isn't something that you start when. This is something you... Well, I'll just let Yoda say it. Always with you what cannot be done. Hear you nothing that I say. You must unlearn what you have learned. All right, I'll give it a try. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no try. What if the way that you were led what if what put you in the seat? What if what you resonated with the leaders who got you to this chair doesn't resonate with the leaders under you? What if the people around you are so different that that fight between, that frustration that shows up, 
gets in the way of us doing what we need to be doing every single day? What if the people who drive us the most crazy are the first ones to invite to the table? What if the ones who think so differently than we do are the ones that we have to get their opinion on what it is that we're working with? I'm not saying it is. I'm asking what if it is. And don't test this out until you test it in. Quick show of hands. Who's got a stack of books on their nightstand They keep telling themselves they're going to read when they have time they're going to read? Who's got a magazine subscription that stacks up on the coffee table that you're going to get time to? Who gets an email newsletter that's now in a folder called To Read Later? You see all these authors, all these TED Talks, all these speakers, all these editors of magazines, they're the ones who are filtering what you think. It's amazing whenever a senior leader gets up here, and I wasn't here for, uh, for, for Goldfein's speech yesterday, General Goldfein's speech yesterday, he did come to kick off the LDC two times ago. And what was fascinating is whenever one of these leaders mentions a book title, what happens? Y'all write it down. They're filtering what and how you think, which is awesome. Awesome. Just know that that's what's happening. Short story on this one. Years ago, I wanted to write for Harvard Business Review. I thought that'd be a great way to get my stuff into more people's hands. Let me write an article. I'll submit it to Harvard Business Review. So I emailed Harvard Business Review. Hi, my name's Jason. I write on leadership. I run these programs around the world, blah, blah, blah. Can I submit an article to Harvard Business Review? What's the program? He emailed me. They emailed me back. And this guy, Audie Ignatius, says, Dear Mr. Womack, we receive 70 articles a month. And then he gave me the outline of what to do in order to get my magazine article into Harvard Business Review. I took the magazine. I flipped through it. That month, four articles were published. How many did you receive? How many did you publish? Now, here's what I imagine. Those other 66, were they crap? Sorry. No. This cat had to filter. That's my symbol for filter. Hashtag filter. Okay. He had to filter and say, here's 66 that didn't make the cut. These four did. So what did I do? I did what every natural person in this room would probably do. I went to the internet and I typed in Audie Ignatius. I clicked enter and there was his LinkedIn profile, his Twitter profile, his Facebook profile. There he was speaking at a conference. There he was doing a presentation. There he was ed editing another article. And I started following the editor who was filtering what I was reading. And I started to realize this guy's really only writing about one thing over and over again. Cognitive diversity is allowing yourself to look down the list of things that you want to get better at, and I hope you caught the method behind this. I'm not here to tell you what to improve, but I would love to tell, help you how you improve. And if that list is handy of what you want to be better at a year from now, here's your charge. You go down that list one at a time and you go off to the side and you start putting people's initials, people's names. You start writing down the people you know that you don't know and you'll never know. But then you bucket them. There's three kinds of people that I'm going to go to when I want to get better at something. There's three different kinds of people I'm going to call, text, or email asking them for help. There's three kinds of authors I'm going to go read. There's three kinds of dead people. I'm going to go to Wikipedia and suck down their, book, their biography. One kind of person is the visionary. The visionary. They're the ones that when you bring them an idea, they're listening to the idea and they're smiling. Do you have someone like this? They're, you're talking, they're like, oh, wow, oh, wow. And then they add to it. You know what we could do? Visionary. I'll go to a visionary and say, hey, I, I want to write a little booklet. It's going to be like 60 pages long. I think about 10 people are interested in reading it. And they'll go, yeah, yeah, let's get 100 people to read it. Uh, yeah, I've got this little speech. I want to invite some people to a coffee shop. Maybe I can invite like five people to the coffee shop. I can talk about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can invite 50 people. We'll go rent out the venue. And then there's the realist. The realist. Got to be careful about the realist. If the visionary is there to add a zero, the realist is there. Well, they're there to tell you you misspelled there. 
You ever brought someone into your office, show them PowerPoint that you're going to brief on? Hey, look at this PowerPoint. Let me run this by you. Click, click, click. Then I'm going to click, click, click. There's a story. Click, click, click. You get through all 48 pages of your PowerPoint, and they look at you and go, yeah, it's all right. Page two, the second slide, you misspelled a word. You're like, oh, man. You missed it. Actually, you missed it. The visionary, you bring in to build it up. The realist, you bring in to edit it down. And that leaves me with the accountability buddy. What's the accountability's job? They don't build it up. They don't break it down. They ask you one simple question. When would you like to check in? Oh, I like to check in a week. Do you want me to call you or are you going to call me? I'll call you. If you don't call me, what would you like me to do? Here's my question to every single one of you. Can you start to attach your visionaries, your realists, and your accountability buddies to the changes that you want to make. Where do you go to recharge? Who do you spend time with that helps you get better? I'm going to outline this one for you, give you some homework should you want it. I'm a former high school teacher. I have to give homework, so here it is. But sometime tonight, you make a little Excel spreadsheet down one side of the Excel spreadsheet, you write down the people's names you're going to talk to the most this week. For those of you here at the orientation, it could be someone that you know you're scheduled to have a coffee with tomorrow. It's someone that you know you're going to sit next to tomorrow. It might be someone that you're going to check in with tonight, whether that's a spouse, whether that's a kid, whether that's a buddy, whether that's a coach. You write down those five people that you know you're going to talk with and you start to track what kind of a conversation do I need to have so I can get after these goals that I've set? Now look, some of the people that you talk with tonight, you're going to call, who's going to check in with their spouse tonight? There's going to be a couple of you. Anybody going to check in? So some conversations you need to check in. Hey, did you do that thing? Are we done with that thing? Do you need me to help you with that thing? Very transactional conversation. Someone comes into your office. They close the door behind. They need help with this thing. They have a tasker for you. A transaction, a to-do. I just keep them all T's. The tasks start the meeting. The tasks start the conversation. What continues the conversation? I think Chief Wright would have called it emotional intelligence. I called it relationship building, rapport building, and respect. It's just R. You see, here's the fascinating thing. If you ask me to do something and then I do it, if you ask me to do something, I do the task, what happens to our relationship? Stays at worst, what does it do at best? It grows. Well, let's take the opposite. If you ask me to do something and I don't do it, and you have to remind me to do it, and then I do it poorly, what happens to the relationship? Stays at best. Usually goes down. Well, Jason, why would I want to develop relationships? Why would I want to develop rapport? Why would I want to get better at the human domain? Do I really need to do this emotional intelligence stuff to which I'll submit to you? How many of you are in this room because someone along the way helped you? I call it opportunity or option or an opening. You see, I still don't know to this day what made me put down that piece of chicken at the Cleveland Hotel and walk up to some bald guy from Mildenhall. But because I said hello and introduced myself, because I stayed in touch after he left, and because I went to Mildenhall and did what I said I would do, he gave me a shot. And I'm not the only one. Every single one of us is here because at some point down the way, an opportunity showed up. Did you catch the arrows behind me? Did you catch them? As soon as an opportunity shows up, what do I have? A tasker, a transaction, a to-do, and I better handle the to-do so I can develop the relationship. I want to develop the relationship so a new opportunity shows up, a new opportunity shows up, and now I can demonstrate working together, together. Who do you need to sit down with tonight? Who do you need to talk with this week? And who do you need to put on your calendar to have regular conversations with? And here's what it looks like. It's just a little Excel spreadsheet or there in our green books, it's a little matrix. I write the names down the left-hand side and then I fill in the blanks. 
My guess is that if you actually really, really dove into the next three days that you have here at Miramax, well, you leave Friday, you could fill in a whole mess of topics of what to tell people, ask people, converse with people, build with people. When you get back next Monday, now I have a reason for a meeting. Oh, by the way, if you really want to start to play this, you ever do that game where you had the list of states down the one side and the list of capitals down the other and you drew the lines to connect the states to the capitals? Juno to Alaska, which still messed me up because it should be Anchorage. It doesn't matter. Anyway, you played that game, right? You can do that with the first part of our activity today and this part of our activity today. What do I want to get better at and who can help me? What do I want to get better at? And who can I call? What can I get better at? What book can I read? Because she recommended it. Of course, I'm here. And the piece of paper I need to read from is way back there. So bear with me. I want to talk for a moment about gratitude. And how important gratitude is. See, the fascinating thing about gratitude is it sticks. It stays. Once something happens good, we hold on to it. Quick show of hands. Who's ever received a thank you card? Big show of hands. Cool. How many of you kept a thank you card on your desk for a while? A while. I got a thank you card? Keep it right there. Imagine just a little bit of acknowledgement, just a little bit of gratitude come your way. And I'm not making this up. I'm going to read this little sweet report. Individuals who focused on being grateful rather than on not being angry. Did I describe any parents in the room? I'm not going to get angry. I'm not, cannot, I'm not going to get Individuals who focused on being grateful rather than on not being angry were found to positively impact a variety of importantly physiological functions such as improved heart, pulse, and respiration levels. Literally, gratitude slows you down. Chief Wright talked about it this morning. When something shows up and the blood rushes to the back of our brain, the limbic system, the part of the brain that's designed to fight or flee, none of you freeze. Gratitude slows you down. Pausing slows you down. So my question to every single one of us in this room is, where is your gratitude? Where is it? During the day, during the night, where is it? Maybe another way of saying this, and I'll lead into it, is how do you decide when your day is done? How do you fall asleep at night? Years ago, I had a mentor of mine sit down, and she said, Hey, Jason, I want you to run an experiment. At the time I was getting my master's degree, I was studying self-talk and and psychology and and what we tell ourselves about what we're facing. Uh, Who talks to themselves, by the way? Anyone talk to themselves? And then who talks out loud to yourself? Okay, watch out for them. They're weird. No, sir, I studied this for way too long. And there's a conversation going on in our heads all the time. So my mentor sat me down. She said, Hey, Jason, here's your experiment. She said, For five nights... As you fall asleep, the last thing you do is take out a 3 by 5 note card. Remember these from college, 3 by 5 note cards? Maybe you wrote papers or you did the flashcards for the kids. You take a 3 by 5 note card, and on one 3 by 5 note card, right before you fall asleep, you write down what you're grateful for. She said, go do that for five nights and see what happens. Now, the fascinating thing is a 3 by 5 note card, 3 by 5 it's not that big. 3 by 5 3 by 5 that's it. Size of my hand. So this is in 1997. Martha had me write down for five nights at the end of the day what I was grateful for. I didn't stop. To this day, the last thing I do before my nightlight goes out is I pull out a notebook and I write down what I'm grateful for. And what I found was the categorical difference when what I used to do was write down my task list for the next day When I moved to writing my gratitude for today, I slept better. I relaxed. I think I put a bow on the day. Now, I'm not asking you to do this for the rest of your careers. I'm asking you to give me five nights. Go find three 
five, three by five note cards and a pen. You can start while you're here, get three, four nights done while you're here. Go home and see what happens for you. Acknowledgement. How important is acknowledgement? How important is it for when something's happening or after something has happened for us to notice the good stuff happening? I mean, could us noticing what's happening actually engage people to do more? Could us noticing what's happening get them to perform at higher and higher levels of their ability at the time? Here's what it looks like with a little one who's winning with blocks. When were you that excited about anything? <laughs> and by the way, I don't think the infant would have done that on their own. It took the community. So because I'm into fitness and health and movement and rest and nutrition, I've got one more activity for you. This one I'm going to ask you to stand up one more time. This will be the last activity of the day. This time, however, I do need you to grab your phones. So if you've got your phones with you or your iPad, grab it. If you don't have your phone, just uh, pretend. So, uh, last little personal story here. Back in 2007, uh, my wife Jody and I, we decided to leave the safety net of a paycheck and we started our own company back in 2007. Uh, we're going to start our own company. We're going to be the captains of our own ship. We're going to be in charge. And for the next 12 years, we were. And uh, we did a lot. 12, 7, yeah, 19. Here we are. Uh, we did a lot. During that time, I kept reaching out. I found cognitively diverse people. I built my team. All the stuff that you're seeing up here I did, which got me to working with you today. And there was one conversation with one guy, my mentor, Jim. Back in 2008-9, somewhere in there early on, I was having a breakfast with Jim, and in between bites of oatmeal and pancake, I was eating pancake, he was eating oatmeal, Jim said to me, Jason, what's your gratitude plan for your business? Now, folks, I'm a talker for a living. That's what got me here today. And at breakfast, I was speechless. I had a marketing plan. I had a development plan. I had a content plan. I had a business plan, gratitude plan. And Jody will tell you, I didn't sleep that night. I didn't have a gratitude plan. I didn't know what that meant. So I grabbed a five-day experiment. And the challenge I gave to myself was, I'm going to go through the next five days, and during the day, I'm going to find someone who did something cool that helped me, and I'm going to let them know. And my thank you card, it's usually four, six sentences. That's it. You can do it shorter. I usually write down what they did and how it made me a part of whether it made it easier that day, whether it made me feel more comfortable that day, but what they did that helped. Oh, I don't put a business card in my thank you card. This is not a marketing play. I don't put my return address on my thank you card. I don't want you to thank me for the thank you card. Rarely even sign my name. I'm going to get you to practice. It's Tuesday. You've been gone for a couple of days from wherever you were. I'm going to ask you to send someone a thank you text. Take a couple minutes. Pick someone who recently made your day, your life, your work, your world a little bit easier and just give them a one, three, five liner. You'll pull up their name. You'll write a few sentences. When you click send, grab a seat and then we'll take today to a conclusion.
This is a good one. I'll put myself on the civilian thin ice. Quick show of hands. Who's feeling a little uncomfortable now? Chief Wright's not here, so we can raise our hands. And my hope is that feeling of uncomfort has been coupled with a knowing, a feeling, an understanding of the tools that are right there at your disposal. The last thing that you need is someone like me to stand on stage and tell you what to get better at. That's not what this presentation was for. My hope is that the woman or man in the mirror who gets to look back at you tonight, the person that they see when they look at you, is a little bit more willing to step into that human domain of leadership. For some reason, in 1943, Ernie Havoker decided to serve his country. Sometime between then and today, you decided to serve your country. And on 22 January, I was blessed enough to join you. I am your airman, and I depend on you. Thank you.